This video will look at Copeman's theorem and Hartree-Fock theory for an explanation of what our orbital energies mean. So in the previous two videos, we went through the work of deriving the fact that in order to get the best possible Hartree-Fock orbitals we can, the best approximation to the true energy and the true orbitals of the system, that what we should do is try to minimize the determinant energy. And when we minimize the determinant energy, we end up with an expression where our uh, canonical spin orbitals, uh, those that are orthonormal to one another, end up all being uh, eigenfunctions of the Fock operator. So when we have the Fock operator act on a particular spin orbital, chi j, the result is the orbital energy, epsilon j, times the same spin orbital again, chi j. And this is true whether j is equal to 1, 2, etc., up to uh, typically infinity if we're solving this problem uh, exactly in principle, up to a, the whole complete set of spin orbitals for the system. Okay, so let's start uh, looking at what these orbital energies are in that case. So let's take our, our expression for, for the Fock operator there, and let's left multiply and integrate by chi star i. So we're going to multiply both sides by chi star i and then integrate over all coordinates of electron 1. So we get this type of uh, Fock uh, matrix element here on the left. We get the orbital energy and the overlap of these two spin orbitals on the right. And of course, if we have the canonical spin orbitals, uh, by definition, those spin orbitals are going to be orthonormal to one another. So that means that we're going to get the orbital energy times the Kronecker delta. So if i and j are the same, then this is going to be 1. And if i and j are different, then this is going to be 0. OK, so that means our orbital energy is actually the integral over all coordinates of electron 1 of chi star i, Fock operator acting on chi i. So substituting in what the Fock operator is, we have the uh, same complex conjugate integrated over all space of the one electron operator, H1, meaning the kinetic energy and attraction to all the nuclei, plus the sum over all the occupied spin orbitals, B equals 1 to N, of the Coulomb operator minus the exchange operator of all of those occupied spin orbitals acting on our spin orbital I. Then if we break this uh, sum up into the, into the different integrals, we have the one electron energy in this integral. We have the Coulomb integral for, with uh, orbital b plus the exchange integral with, with orbital b. I believe this needs to be a negative. Let me go ahead and change that. Much better. So we have the Coulomb integral with of, uh, orbital i with orbital b and minus the exchange integral of, of orbital i with orbital b. So then substituting those in terms of the uh, physicist notation integrals, we have i h1 i plus sum over b i b i b minus i b b i. And if I turn this into some anti-symmetrized uh, physicist notation integral, I have i b double bar i b, representing this minus that. Okay, so we have, um, if we take a general kind of matrix element here, we have uh, chi i, j b, chi j. That would be um, the physicist notation integral i b, j b, or the chemist notation integral i j b b. Uh, note that in the physicist integral, of course, you have both of the stars on the left. So this is uh, uh, chi star i electron 1, chi b star electron 2, chi j electron 1, chi b electron 2. Whereas in the chemist notation, you have electron 1 on the left and electron 2 on the right. Uh, chi i star 1, chi j 1, chi b star 2, and chi b 2. Um, and then, of course, um, doing the same thing for exchange, uh, it would be i b b j, or in chemist notation, i b b j where in chemist notation you exchange this and that, and in physicist notation we exchange this and that. And of course, uh, noting also that for the anti-symmetrized repulsion of an or a spin orbital with itself is zero because the 
Coulomb and exchange parts would cancel. All right, so then this particular um, orbital energy, if we have some occupied uh, spin orbital, would be its one electron energy plus the sum of all of the orbitals which are not itself, because note that if I include, I could include the term where B equals A, but it's just gonna end up being zero anyway. Uh, we would get this Coulomb and exchange integral as a result. But epsilon A here I'm representing as some occupied spin orbital for its orbital energy, because it feels the presence of N minus one other electrons, and it has the kinetic energy and nuclear, nuclear attraction of itself. For epsilon r, which I'm saying is some unoccupied orbital, then what we have is we still have the same one electron energy. It still has whatever kinetic energy and uh, nuclear attraction energy it, it, it has in that orbital. But then the sum over b, uh, there's not a term that cancels because this is unoccupied or a virtual orbital. So instead of being repelled by n minus one electrons, it is effectively repelled by all n electrons. So basically for an occupied, for an unoccupied or virtual orbital, there's an extra term here in the two electron energy where it's repelled by one more electron than all of the occupied orbitals are effectively. So for, for virtual and occupied orbitals, the expression for what their orbital energies are vary slightly uh, because they actually are repelled by a different number of electrons. So one important thing to note here in Hartree-Fock theory is that the sum of the orbital energies is not the same thing as the system energy. Because if I add up the sum of all the orbital energies, I get a sum of all the one electron energies, which is fine. That's the same as it is in the term for the ground state determinant energy. But if I add up all of the orbitals, all of the orbitals interact with all of the other electrons so if you add up all of the orbital energies, you're actually going to be double counting the number of electron pair repulsions you get through the Coulomb and exchange interaction. It's going to be just a naive double sum. Whereas if you want to do this uh, for the total energy, you either have to indicate it as a pairwise sum or one half of the naive double sum. The diagonal elements where A equals B cancel out because of this, uh, because of this fact here. And each of these terms appears twice in the double sum, so the one half takes care of that. So in fact, the two electron energy, uh, you have twice as much of it as there really is when you're just adding up orbital energies. So just note that the actual ground state determinant energy is not the sum of all of the orbital energies because that double counts all the electron repulsion. Okay, so on to Koppmann's theorem uh, for talking about what these occupied and virtual orbital energies represent. So let's create an expression here. Let's say n e naught. That's our ground state determinant for this molecule when we have n electrons. That that would just be the expectation value integral of the ground state determinant uh, with the Hamiltonian operator. And we'll also create the expression n minus 1 e c. This would be the energy of a system where you have n minus one electrons and you have removed an electron from orbital C. So spin orbital C is gone, we have ionized that and the remaining result is all the other electrons remain. So assuming that we remove that electron and none of the other orbitals change, um, spoiler alert, in real life they actually do change, but this is a nice first order approximation. So if we approximate it that way, then the energy of this determinant would be the following expectation value uh, integral of the Hamiltonian of this n minus one electron system. All right, so as I noted that the energy is a sum over all the occupied orbitals of their one electron energy plus one half of the double sum of all the pair of repulsions. So in the case of the, uh, in the case of the system which is missing one electron, uh, we have we have n minus one one electron terms, and we have the the pairwise sums of all the pairs which didn't involve electron C. And additionally, we can examine the case where we have n plus one electrons, and now we've added an extra electron, and we've added it to orbital R, where R is some initially unoccupied orbital. 
where now we're summing over the set of all A equals 1 to N and orbital R for the one electron energies. And we're summing over the, all uh, pairs of electrons in the double sum, which includes A equals 1 to N, B equals 1 to N, and including R in each of those sums there. So if we work through the math of what, what uh, that ends up being, and I'll leave that as an exercise to you if you like, you get, end up getting that the ionization potential or the difference in energy from the state where we have removed one electron versus the ground state is actually the one, where is the one electron energy we lost from electron C in orbital C, and then removing all of the pairs repulsions of that particular electron. And if we look at what the electron affinity is from having added that extra electron up into uh, un previously unoccupied virtual orbital R, we get that's E naught minus E n plus one minus n plus one E R is we get the extra, that's the effect of the extra one electron energy in orbital R and all of the extra pairs of the uh, extra pairs of interactions of those now repelling electron, the electron in orbital R. So you'll note that these two differences that I have spelled out here are actually exactly equivalent to the expression for the orbital energy of orbital C and orbital R. So in fact, we can interpret the orbital energy of an occupied orbital as the negative ionization potential of the energy it takes to remove that particular electron from the system. So if we have n electrons and we want to pluck out an electron from orbital c, the ionization potential of that system is approximately uh, the orbital energy of that orbital c. So in fact, the orbital energies don't tell us what the total energy of the molecule is because of this double counting problem. They actually tell us about the ionization potential of removing them. And it turns out that these ionization potentials due to cancellation of error in Hartree-Fock are actually often quite good approximations to the real ionization potential. Conversely, for some virtual orbital, uh, epsilon r, the uh, orbital energy of an unoccupied or virtual orbital approximately represents the electron affinity of that orbital or the negative electron affinity of how much would the energy of the system change were we to put an extra electron into that particular orbital? And of course, this approximation is used much less often because all of the errors that work in your favor that cancel out and give a pretty decent answer for the ionization potential actually go in the wrong direction for the electron affinity here. So this is not very frequently used uh, for calculating electron affinities of actual molecules as uh, calculating electron affinities is actually a significantly more difficult problem in general uh, for quantum chemistry simulations than calculating ionization potentials for reasons that we will not get into until uh, several chapters down the line.